the Second World War was full of complex and massive naval engagements. However, one campaign that seems to have been forgotten is the successful pirate war carried out by German merchant raiders that terrorised Allied ships across the oceans. One of their most important theatres of operation was in Australian waters, where war was breaking out for the first time. The raiders mined the coasts of numerous Australian and New Zealand cities, devastated the island of Nauru, and sunk countless Allied vessels, among them the pride of the Royal Australian Navy. All this before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. In this video, we'll determine what significance German merchant raiders in Australian waters had on the Allied war effort in World War II. In the early years of the Third Reich, war with the British Empire was unthinkable. Not only did the United Kingdom boast the world's largest navy, but Germany's military was also massively restricted by the Treaty of Versailles. However, the ambitions of Führer Adolf Hitler would force to underpower Kriegsmarine's hand. The commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine, Admiral Erich Reder, understood that Germany could only wage trade war on the British Empire's maritime commerce by attacking its merchant vessels. Admiral Karl Dönitz echoed this notion on the day Germany invaded Poland, when he wrote that the one and only possibility of bringing England to her knees with the forces of our navy lies in attacking her sea communications. Germany's primary weapon in achieving this goal would be the U-boats, which were built and deployed clandestinely to avoid attracting the attention of the Allies. However, the Kriegsmarine also deployed many surface warships of various types to wreak havoc on the high seas, among them being merchant raiders. Perhaps it was because that his last name was Raider. <laughs> merchant raiders, also known as auxiliary cruisers or Hilfskreuzer, are commandeered civilian vessels that are converted into warships for the purpose of attacking enemy merchant vessels. The Germans were long interested in auxiliary cruisers for commerce raiding and first deployed them at the start of World War I. The so-called Kreuzer Krieg achieved moderate success and even operated near Australia, with the radar Emden being sunk by the HMA Sydney. However, Germany was unable to support them abroad for long due to the British blockade and the capture of Germany's overseas colonies. Each raider was armed with six 5.9 inch guns, six or seven anti-aircraft guns, four to six torpedo tubes, one or two seaplanes, and a large complement of mines. However, their origins as civilian freighters introduced unique challenges. The fastest raider deployed, Cormoran, could achieve a top speed of around 18 knots, while the slowest raiders, such as Orion and Vida, were plagued with engine problems and could only manage 14 knots. This led to many frustrating instances where their prey simply outran them. However, their appearance also meant that they could easily disguise themselves as peaceful cargo ships of almost any nation. Each raider typically carried a large assortment of flags that matched the false identities they assumed by raising or lowering masts and funnels, altering their profiles with dummy bows and structures, and repainting their hulls while at sea. It was only when the German naval ensign, with its large swastika, was raised and its guns were exposed that their true intentions were revealed. Captains for these vessels were chosen based on their unconventional thinking. They were handpicked for their strong leadership skills and daring nature. The captains were likewise honoured to be chosen to command these vessels. The captain of the raider Cormoran, Tador Detmers, was delighted to have been given command of an auxiliary cruiser, as he had heard of their exploits from the First World War. The crew was also comprised entirely of volunteers, meaning they were typically much more professional and disciplined than conscripts. They were so highly regarded by the German Navy, that when word was received that the raider had sunk, and most of the crew had survived, six German U-boats and five Italian submarines abandoned all other operations to rescue the crew and bring them home. The mission given to these raiders was to force the stronger Royal Navy to dedicate its warships to protecting merchant ships, thereby thinly dispersing its strength. Attacking merchant vessels could also disrupt trade and force the British to create more convoys and organise hunts, which would slow down trade further and force ships to take longer routes, causing indirect economic damage. Therefore, success was not measured in tonnage lost, but in the disruption caused. The raiders could nonetheless expect easy victories because enemy merchant vessels often sailed alone and were unarmed. They were also tasked with intercepting raw materials that were crucial for the British war effort and capturing them for Germany. 
but aside from this, they were essentially given free reign to do as they saw fit. The first cruisers to be deployed were Atlantis, Orion, Vida, Thor, Penguin and Comet. Orion, the second raider to be deployed, sailed from Germany towards Australian waters on the 6th of April 1940. Australia is placed in a very strategically advantageous location and numerous Pacific trade routes converge at Sydney and Melbourne and Indian Ocean trade at Fremantle. In recognition of this, the British created a defensive operational area known as the Australia Station to guard shipping in the area. Australia's reliance on exports for its economy and Britain's insatiable thirst for Australian and New Zealand goods made this part of the world a huge target for the Germans. Australia is also very isolated and was poorly defended, therefore forcing Commonwealth forces to disperse greatly. At the start of the war, the Australia station was extended by 1500 miles westward into the Indian Ocean and eastwards past New Zealand and Fiji. This overlap meant that the Australian and New Zealand navies often collaborated to protect shipping in the region. On the night of the 13th and 14th of June, Orion placed 228 mines across the Hauraki Gulf, just off Auckland. Five days later, the RMS Niagara struck one of the mines and sank, followed by the freighters Periri, Baltanic and Port Bowen. This marked the beginning of the war in the South Pacific. In response, New Zealand closed all ports stopped all maritime trade in its waters and sent minesweepers to the Rocky Gulf. Australia also began a hunt for the Orion, but by then the raider was long gone. At the same time, the raiders Comet and Penguin both departed Germany and sailed for Australia. By the 4th of August, the Orion entered the Coral Sea and steamed towards Brisbane. The Orion exercised a great amount of caution around the Australian coast, as there were regular air and sea patrols, but found no prey. Orion then turned to New Caledonia, and sank the French steamer Notto. Orion then entered the Tasman Sea and fought her first duel with the New Zealand freighter Turrikina, which was carrying food destined for Britain. Turrikina managed to send out a distress signal before being sunk. The HMAS Perth and the HMNZS Achilles were both sent to intercept, but the Orion once again managed to slip away. This became a common story as the war progressed, as the raiders' captains were incredibly cunning when it came to intercepting and silencing enemy vessels. But even when the enemy vessels did manage to call for help, the small number of ships and the vastness of the search area meant that the Allies often struggled to hunt down the Germans. After sinking the Turrikina, Orion deployed a series of dummy mines off the coast of Albany, Western Australia, and then rendezvoused with the Raider Comet at the Caroline Islands. Captain Vaya of the Orion proposed that they work together. Captain Ison of the Comet agreed, and so the Far East Squadron was born, joined by the supply ship Cormorland as a scout. Meanwhile, the Penguin entered the Indian Ocean on the 20th of August and made a name for herself by using several ingenious tactics. On the 26th of August, Penguin used one of her seaplanes, disguised as an RAF fighter, to drop orders onto the deck of the Norwegian tanker Filefell, which ordered the tanker to sail to coordinates where the Penguin was waiting. When Filefell turned away, the same plane was relaunched and tore down her radio tower with a grappling hook. On her way to Australian waters, Penguin narrowly escaped being destroyed by the British freighter Benevon, when one of her shells narrowly missed the storage compartment containing Penguin's 300 mines. On the 7th of October, Penguin intercepted the Norwegian tanker Storstad and converted her into the mine layer Passat. Between the 28th of October and the 7th of November, Penguin and Passat laid a combined total of 230 mines off the cities of Newcastle, Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide and the Bass Strait. Their first victim was the British cargo liner Cambridge, which sunk in the Bass Strait. Two days later, the MS City of Ravel became the first American vessel sunk by enemy action in World War II, despite being under strict orders not to attack American ships. The mines also claimed the Nimbin and the Millimunmu, and critically damaged the cargo ship Hertford. This caused Australian ports to be closed and minesweepers sent out, as well as another hunt to be organised, but the Penguin slipped away. In November, the Far East Squadron formulated a plan to attack the enemy phosphate industry on the Australian administrated island of Nauru, which was crucial for the agriculture of Australia and New Zealand. In December, they approached the island well disguised as Japanese merchant ships, successfully fooling those viewing from shore. The squadron sunk the phosphate ships Triona, Finney, Triadic, Triasta and Comata. 
The Australians were alerted that the German raiders were in the area, but with no warships nearby, they were unable to help the Nauru garrison. The Far East Squadron's attack on Nauru was thus an utter success, but their primary concern now was the prisoners they had captured. The captured crews were generally treated well by the Germans under their written and unwritten codes of the sea. They usually ate the same food as the Germans and were allowed periods each day to go on deck and get fresh air. However, they also represented a huge burden on the raiders' supplies and couldn't stay for long. On the 21st of December, almost 500 captives were released on Amaral, northeast of Papua New Guinea, despite the chance that they could provide useful intelligence to the enemy about the Germans' operations. They were given weapons to defend themselves, food and water, and several small boats with which to sail back to civilization. However, Captain Ison was still not satisfied and returned to Nauru on the 27th of December. Since the island was still undefended, the residents were forced to evacuate, and Comet bombarded the island's phosphate facilities. The combined attacks on Nauru impacted the Australian and New Zealand economies and led to the rationing of fertilizer. It took 10 weeks for phosphate shipments from Nauru to resume, albeit at a reduced output. This caught the attention of German High Command, and Eisen was promoted to Commodore. The auxiliary cruiser's successes also earned the admiration of Adolf Hitler, who ordered more to be deployed. These new vessels were the Steyr, Komaran, Michael, Coronel, and Hansa. With High Command now more supportive of the raider operations, these vessels were generally of better quality than the previous generation of raiders. The last merchant raider of note to enter Australian waters was the Cormoran, captained by Tador Detmers. But after she departed on the 3rd of December 1940, the tide had begun to turn against the raiders. The naval blockade in the North Sea and the English Channel had strengthened, meaning the Coronel and Hansa never made it to open seas. The Allies were also understandably becoming fed up with raider attacks and ordered all ships to use their radios when approached by mysterious vessels. This forced the raiders to identify their prey by day and wait until nightfall to attack. Commander Henry Burrell, Australian Director of Operations and Plans, explained, With such a small navy, however, we were forced to focus on focal areas and the entrances to main harbours. Ships outside this protection were routed evasively by our control service to, it was hoped, confuse the enemy. The increased Australian presence in the area forced the Orion and Comet to return to Europe. On the 26th of June 1941, the Comoran entered the Bay of Bengal while disguised as the Japanese merchant freighter Kinkamaru and sunk the Yugoslavian cargo ship Belibit, and later the Australian vessel Mariba on the same day. W.A. Jones, an Australian prisoner of war from the Mariba, had an awful time in the Cormoran's sweltering hold, eating stale food and didn't get along with the Germans at all, but he was nonetheless treated with dignity. The Cormoran spent months hunting around northwest Australia and the Indian Ocean and drew up plans to mine the shipping lanes near Cape Lewin and Fremantle, but this was abandoned when Detmers detected radio chatter from the HMAS Canberra, escorting a convoy. After transferring her prisoners to the Cormoran, Cormoran proceeded to Shark Bay instead. However, Detmers unexpectedly encountered the HMAS Sydney on the 19th of November. Recently withdrawn to Australia, and the successor to the warship that sunk the Emden 27 years ago. A clash was unavoidable, so Detmers ordered all men to battle stations. Now if you've seen the movie Wrath of Khan, this will begin to look very familiar. Despite the HMAS Sydney's overwhelming superiority in firepower, the Germans held the advantage of surprise, whereas the Australians were unaware of the Cormoran's true nature. Initially, Detmers tried to avoid a confrontation by tricking their foe into the thinking they were the Dutch freighter Strait Malacca. To attempt this ruse, the Cormoran had to approach closer to the Sydney with the additional advantage of getting into a better position if a fight broke out. Meanwhile, Captain Joseph Burnett of the Sydney considered the Cormoran's behaviour suspicious and kept the Sydney's guns trained on the Cormoran, but he didn't really think that a German raider would be in such remote waters. The Cormoran also tried to delay the identification procedures, which allowed the Cormoran to get as close as 900 metres to the Sydney. The closer the Sydney got, the greater the offensive parity between the two ships became, as Sydney's long-range weapons were useless at such a distance. In the end, the Australians asked for the Strat Malacca's secret signal, a procedure invented specifically to detect disguised raiders. Detmus didn't have the signal, and now a fight was truly unavoidable. Just as Burnett noticed that something was off and started to order action stations, Detmers ordered the Kriegsmarine flag to be raised and their concealed guns to be exposed, and to open fire. The Cormorans first salvo for short, and the Sydney immediately returned fire, although they missed as well. The Cormoran fired again, this time hitting Sydney's bridge and control tower, probably killing Burnett and the other officers there. 
At the same time, the Cormoran's secondary armament rained fire on the Sydney's upper decks, anti-aircraft guns and torpedo batteries, preventing the enemy from returning fire. Soon, almost all of Sydney's turrets were disabled and a large fire had erupted on their midsection. With its last two remaining turrets, however, Sydney managed to detonate the raider's oil bunkers, causing a large fire in the Cormoran's engine room and dealing a lethal blow. The Sydney, now engulfed in flames, then limped away, trying to escape back to port. That night, Sydney's damage bow collapsed and rapidly submerged. The Cormoran had sunk the pride of the Royal Australian Navy. Still, Detmers recognised the damage he had received was too severe and ordered the crew to abandon ship. Most of the Cormoran's crew, some 312 men, survived and were later rescued and captured, while all 645 sailors aboard the Sydney perished. In the grand scheme of things, the Raider campaign was vastly overshadowed by Germany's operations in the North Atlantic. However, in the Australian theatre they played a much more major role. The German Raiders sunk a combined total of 110 ships, and sunk or captured around 886,391 gross register tonnes of Allied shipping. Of this, 22 vessels were sunk in Australian waters, or around 135,556 gross register tonnes. In return, only one raider was sunk in Australian waters, the Cormoran, and 78 of her crew were killed. However, as mentioned earlier, the success of the campaign was never going to be measured in tonnage. Germany's goal of forcing enemy forces to disperse was successful, as warships such as the HMAS Sydney were ordered to withdraw from their highly successful missions in the Mediterranean and return to Australia to defend against raider attacks. The Australians and other allies were forced to spend invaluable time and fuel chasing down ghosts. The merchant raiding campaign also dramatically slowed down maritime trade in the region, damaging the economy of the British Empire more than was expected from such an inferior navy. However, it is partly because the raiders were so effective and the Allies were forced to take so many precautions that the raiders themselves became less and less effective. Initially, Australia's defences were insufficient in dealing with attacks in their home waters. The Australian Navy was far too small to effectively defend such a large swath of territory. The Australians were also overly complacent in their geographic isolation. During the Penguins mining operation, the Germans were amazed by the apparent complacent attitude when they found lighthouses in full operation, which served as helpful markers for areas to lay mines. In some cases, the Germans came so close to land that they could see the lights of homes and businesses ashore. It was as if Australia was not at war, or the Australians thought the war was so far away that special precautions were unnecessary. Countermeasures to the German raiders were slowly developed, with secret code signals introduced in December 1940, which compromised the Cormoran. The sinking of the HMA Sydney in 1941 caused a variety of conspiracy theories to emerge and dealt a huge blow to Australian morale. It was only after this that Australia entered something comparable to total war. Convoys were implemented in 1942 and more warships were recalled to Australia, which made further raiding missions unfeasible. This forced the Orion and Comet to return to Europe. The Allies also introduced the Checkmate system to individually identify suspicious vessels with the Admiralty in London, which bypassed the raiders' disguises. The interception of radio communication also led to the destruction of Atlantis and Penguin because their locations were given away. Finally, the entry of the United States into the war doomed the raiding campaign, as it meant that the oceans were far less safe for German raiders, and led to the destruction of the Steyr on the 27th of September 1942, and the Michael on the 20th of October 1943. Ultimately, the raiders failed to bring Australia nor the United Kingdom to their knees. Despite this, the merchant raiders were probably the most cost-effective return on investment the Kriegsmarine made into the commerce warfare element of World War II. The auxiliary cruisers achieved more and cost less than the Kriegsmarine's dedicated surface warships. Germany's battleships, Panzerschiffe and heavy cruisers simply cost too much and achieved too little. More men went down with Bismarck alone than with every single lost merchant raider put together. Of course the raiders were overshadowed by U-boats in the Atlantic but achieved much more than they were expected to, no doubt partially due to the quality of their crews. The German Raider Campaign was an underrated event in Australia's participation in the Second World War. Eleven raiders were deployed to attack the furthest reaches of Britain's vast empire to force them to disperse their forces across the world. Four of these raiders played a significant role in Australian borders. The Orion, after lading hundreds of mines off New Zealand, attacked and sunk several ships in the Coral and Tasman Seas. 
together with a comet, she also raided the island of Nauru, then under Australia's protection, destroying the island's phosphate facilities and several ships nearby. The Penguin used several ingenious tactics to lure and ensnare merchant vessels and, with the assistance of the converted mine layer Passat, also placed mines off the cities of Newcastle, Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide and the Bass Strait. Finally, the Cormoran destroyed several ships in the western half of the Australian station, before being sunk in a mutually destructive and hugely controversial battle with the HMA Sydney. All these raiders consistently managed to evade detection and interception by Australian and Allied forces. They were successful in forcing the Allied naval forces to disperse, however they did not cause significant enough damage to the Australian war effort. Despite this, they achieved much more than they were expected to and were very cost effective, indicating the possible utility of future raiding campaigns.